Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Hello, everyone. Great to be here, and it's great to see so many MIT alumni back on campus. Okay, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. All right, good. There we go. Now, of course, I'm, yeah. Great. Okay, good to, um, to see so many of you here. It's wonderful to have this opportunity um, to speak with you. And I'm going to be talking about a clean energy transition and some of the work that we do in my group to look at the likelihood of this um, and to compare different technologies. And I wanted to start out with a question for you. Um, which is uh, the following. How likely do you think it is that the United States will rely on greater than 30% renewable energy, electricity, by 2040? Um, and I've given you a few options here. Very interested to see what you think. So um, just to give you a sense, today we have uh, about 5% of our electricity coming from wind energy and less than 1% from solar in the US. Um, and uh, we'll just give a few minutes here to, to see what people think. Okay, so it looks like we've reached, oh, there's some change, somewhat unlikely, okay. We're getting a little bit more maybe optimistic about the transition. Okay, so this is a bit, you know, some, some optimism or, or pessimism, I guess, depending on what you want to happen. Um, so the second question is, how likely is the U.S. to use carbon-free energy sources to meet more than 80% of energy demand by 2050? And that's energy for transportation, for electricity. So this is obviously a more ambitious target. And people feel this is less likely. OK, so this is actually the target that would need to be reached in order for the US and other developed countries to meet uh, their commitments that, that they've made on the global stage, uh, most recently um, in 2015, when a global climate agreement was reached. Um, to reach that goal, uh, developed countries would need to essentially completely decarbonize their energy infrastructure by 2050. Uh, that is the case even with extreme energy efficiency measures. So even with uh, much greater energy efficiency, we need to see this transformation in the energy supply infrastructure in order to meet uh, climate goals that have been set by, by many nations. Um, these, this transition is not likely to happen unless consumers want to purchase clean energy. So you can have public policy incentives and different signals uh, that are given to consumers and investors, but unless those signals are strong enough, unless those technologies uh, appear attractive enough to consumers, they won't transition. And, and by consumers here, I mean electric utilities, I mean um, personal car owners, people purchasing uh, vehicles. Uh, so technologies really have to appear attractive. They have to uh, want, the consumers have to want to adopt them. Um, and part of what we work on in my group is to understand how likely an energy transition is and how technologies are changing over time, how they're, how they're improving, and whether they might meet um, you know, the, the, those criteria that consumers have in order to, to want to adopt them. Um, and I'm very interested in, for example, why some technologies improve more quickly than others, uh, and how we use energy in our daily lives, which technologies might be able to, to meet uh, those patterns of energy demand that we see. Uh, so the idea behind this research is to use data and models to evaluate different energy technologies, and then to take the results of this work to feed into the development process for clean energy, so to inform decisions being made by researchers in the lab, by private investors, and by policymakers. So I thought I'd go through a few of um, 
kind of our recent research results, and it, it's exciting to me because I'll be talking about some, some results that are gonna be coming out in the next few weeks based on really four, four to five years of work uh, for each project. Uh, but to start out with, I wanna can give you a sense of where we've come from in recent decades. So to begin with, I'm gonna show you a solar panel from, um, from 1980, um, and so that is, Here, um, I don't know why that's happening. Okay, let's see here. Okay, there it is. So this is a solar panel. <laughs> Doesn't want to stay up there. There it is. Um, that's from 1980. This is a 1977 Volvo electric vehicle. Okay, so these technologies do not really look like serious contenders. This wasn't that long ago. This is about, you know, three, three and a half to four decades ago. And we can forgive people for uh, perhaps not taking these technologies seriously. Um, and, but we're gonna see how these technologies have changed and the improvement that we've seen in recent decades. But this is sort of where we were starting at not too long ago. Similarly, there have been setbacks in climate negotiations, so we know, <laughs> and I, you know, I have to say, I, I'm really happy to see nobody in the audience kind of looking like this, but, but this was in 2009 um, in Copenhagen, and there was a lot of lead up to this international climate negotiation. We know that policy is really important for any kind of clean energy transition, uh, there had been decades of work leading up to Copenhagen, and there was a lot of disappointment coming out of Copenhagen. So um, bas um, basically, the, the climate negotiations fell apart. These negotiators, poor souls, had been uh, up for many nights, sleepless nights, you know, kind of working all night, as one does at these climate negotiations, and basically were completely fed up. The negotiations ended uh, without an agreement being reached. Okay, but things have been starting to change, and so I'm gonna go through some of where that change has come from, and a lot of it has come from, in fact, technology improvements over time. And so, if we look, for example, at um, progress in solar and wind energy technologies, we see something pretty remarkable. Solar photovoltaics, for example, has declined in price, the price of modules have fallen by 86% since the year 2000. We've seen massive growth rates in both solar and wind. And um, this is interesting because, for example, in the case of solar, uh, these rates of improvement and growth are, and, and certainly rates of cost improvement, are unprecedented among energy technologies. And so one of the things that we ask in my group is how we got here, um, given that these technologies still need to improve in terms of cost to really see widespread competitiveness. We wanna know how, um, if they're likely to continue to improve um, and what avenues might be most promising going forward. And so um, in some recent work, uh, we've been modeling the reason for that really dramatic decline in solar uh, module prices, so 86% over the last 15 years, 99% um, going back to the late 1970s, uh, really going from looking under the hood of these technologies, looking at the device physics, all the way to the public policies that have really driven activity toward improving these technologies. So we see a couple of things. One is that uh, if you look on at, at the left-hand side, efficiency, conversion efficiency of these cells um, has improved dramatically, and it's responsible for the greatest share of that cost decline that we saw in the previous slide. But there have been a number of other improvements as well. And again, this is based on going to the smallest components of a PV cell, building an engineering model of... Um, a device physics model and then an engineering cost model to understand where these cost declines are coming from. Now, if we look at the right-hand side, here I'm showing high-level mechanisms. So those are mechanisms, basically human activity and efforts to improve the technology. We have research and development, economies of scale, learning by doing, shown here. And you can see that research and development and economies of scale have both played a really important role. Those are the things that have basically 
achieve, those efforts have achieved the changes that we see in the left-hand side. So one of the th interesting things to come out of this research is actually a, a conclusion that's relevant to policy. Um, and that is that um, much of that decline in cost that we saw in photovoltaics was actually stimulated by policies that supported market growth of PV, so incentives that then led companies, private companies, to really kick in, begin to compete with one another, innovate, and a lot of that cost improvement has come from this process of policy-induced uh, market growth and competition among firms to improve these technologies. Now, there's still some way to go, um, but there is room for improvement, and we work, for example, with the US Department of Energy, with investors, and with uh, technology development firms um, to help guide their efforts and try to accelerate this process of technology uh, development. Um, and interestingly, this kind of somewhat technical research ended up playing an important role in informing the Paris climate negotiations at the end of last year, as I'll talk about in a minute. Now, for solar to truly be, and other intermittent energy sources to truly be cost competitive, uh, they need to be able to provide energy on demand. So one of the big questions you've probably heard people asking is when will energy storage, will energy storage ever enter the marketplace? So we've been looking at that as well. And again, we have to look at this question from the perspective of consumers. So we're asking, whether it makes sense to install storage with uh, your solar or wind plant uh, in order to increase revenue. So that's what you're doing here. This is the natural variability of solar and wind output on a sample of three days. And then this is how you would operate your plant, uh, your power plant, if you had storage. And so you can increase the revenue in that way. Now, of course, storage isn't free. It comes at a cost. What we're finding is that some storage technologies, and there's really a diversity of different storage technologies, it's actually very difficult to compare them because you need to look at the context in which they're used. They have different cost dimensions and so forth. What we're finding is that some storage technologies today can add value to solar and wind, and that's the case, for example, in Texas. Uh, what we can do with this research is also say, well, for storage to reach widespread competitiveness, how cheap does it have to get? Uh, and so we're, we're doing that as well, again, by looking at the context in which these technologies um, are, are being used. And, um, and so that, there, but there is some, some reason for optimism in energy storage. I will say that for energy storage to continue to make economic sense, costs have to fall and keep up with solar and wind energy, because as solar and wind energy costs fall, there will, if storage costs stay constant, there'll be less and less of an incentive um, for an investor to actually adopt storage. So there, there may be sort of a sweet spot right now in time where storage could be adopted by the marketplace, uh, possibly with uh, some policy incentives uh, to help the process. Now, what about transportation? You hear a lot about electric vehicles nowadays. Today's electric vehicle isn't the one that we saw in the photo earlier. Um, but you also hear a lot about range anxiety. People are quite anxious about losing battery charge, about being stranded on the side of the road. So we decided to look at this by creating a data set and a model, this ended up taking five years, um, of all of um, sort of driving patterns across the entire US, across all US cities, going from second by second resolution, which you need to calculate the energy consumption, to um, patterns uh, you know, across socioeconomic classes um, and so forth, covering the entire US. What we find is that 90% of vehicles can be replaced by a low-cost electric vehicle on an average day, even if only nighttime charging is available. And this number is actually remarkably similar across different US cities, ranging from Houston to, say, a more dense city like New York City. Turns out that consumers can also save money by switching from internal combustion engine vehicles to um, hybrid or battery electric vehicles, or they, they can at least reduce their carbon emissions without having to pay more, uh, more money. So the, the Nissan LEAF, which was modeled in the previous slide, is down here, and you can see that it's at the lower end of costs 
of vehicles per dollar per kilometer traveled and has uh, lowest, the lowest carbon emissions. And so we're working to get this information essentially to consumers' fingertips so that they can you know, have this information, it can inform their decisions, and they can decide what they want to do, uh, what kind of vehicle they want to purchase, and so forth. OK, so <clears throat> solar energy today is not what solar energy was in 1980 nor are electric vehicles. So this is a Tesla in 2016. Uh, this is the Nissan Leaf that I just mentioned. So we've seen quite a bit of change. We've also seen change and movement on the international front. Uh, and an international climate agreement was reached in 2015. Um, and that agreement uh, is somewhat modest in terms of the emissions reductions that it implies but it could imply significant clean energy development um, and expansion. And so if we, use, uh, if, if we use all of the information that we have, we make good decisions about how we invest limited time and money. Uh, this agreement could actually translate into a significant impact um, and possibly a clean energy transition. And I had the opportunity together with my students to feed into this process, actually, uh, because, um, you know, and it, and it turned out that technology development trends and the state of low carbon technology actually emboldened leaders to reach this agreement. Uh, so ahead of the Paris climate negotiations, I was invited to write a report um, and present this report at the White House on how clean energy technologies are improving. That result that I mentioned earlier about photovoltaics cost improvement and where that cost improvement in solar energy is coming from actually played an important role in that report because it suggests that as uh, we put in effort and adopt policies to reduce emissions, um, technology will improve in large part because of public, pri sorry, private sector efforts and, and public sector as well. Um, and because of this, emissions reduction and technology improvement can actually be mutually reinforcing. So you can see in some cases, in some technologies, this virtuous cycle of emissions reduction and uh, technology improvement. So that's something that, that we wrote about in a report ahead of the negotiations, presented it at the White House, uh, which was exciting for me because it's, it's drawing on 10 years of research. Uh, and they referenced this uh, mutually reinforcing cycle in their communications in Paris and also in the press release um, on the agreement. So let me come back and, and conclude uh, with a discussion of this question. Um, how likely is a clean energy transition? So it was interesting to see that, you know, there's some optimism among this group here today, um, but there are also uh, some questions about whether this will happen. And in fact, that is exactly where we are right now. We're at this really interesting point in time where we've seen major improvement in clean energy technologies. Uh, we've seen major growth in certain clean energy technologies, but our economy globally is still almost completely fueled, uh, supported by fossil fuels, right? So that is where glo global economic growth is supported by our consumption of fossil fuels. So we, we have these two situations. On the one hand, technologies are improving. On the other hand, a transition hasn't really yet started to happen. Uh, and so now is a really interesting time, I think, um, in the development of energy systems. For those of you that work in energy and energy markets, um, I think you know this. We don't really know what's going to happen. But with the Paris Agreement, with the, uh, with the commitments that countries have made, while they're not very ambitious, they're ambitious enough that if we make good decisions, uh, we, they may lead to uh, this a clean energy transition. And we could be in a very different place uh, two decades from now. Uh, so this is part of the reason why I find that it's so important and exciting to really try to use data and models to inform those decisions, to inform decisions by engineers, by private investors, and by, by policymakers. Um, and thank you so much for your participation. I think we'll transition to, to Elsa Olivetti now. And she's going to be talking about not just climate change, but also uh, natural resources on Earth and, and the material resource. 
And um, it's great to, thank you so much. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.